Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Margot Robbie is one of the brightest stars in Hollywood, but don't think she's just another pretty face. Robbie's got serious acting chops. Okay, so let's talk about this crying IQ thing. You can really do that. Yes, I did 300 and something episodes on a soap, so I had a fair share of practice <laughs> crying on cue. How? I don't know, mate. I think it's like a muscle. I could say to a director, do you want it on my left eye or right eye? Stop. And tell me the word you want it to drop. And what, what is going <laughs> through your head? Question. Like, where does it come from? I don't know, just... Honestly, it sounds so stupid and, and derivative, but I just think of something sad. <laughs> There's more from my chat with her coming up a little later in the show. So much of what has happened to you seems lucky, but the truth is, it really is a combination of your preparing and going for it and then luck coming in the door. Yeah, there definitely is an element of luck, but it's like, I don't know, it's like you have to work really, really, really hard so that there's room for luck to come in. It's like you got to work and work and work and work and do so much hard work and so much preparation and just tee up all the potential opportunities. Then Lee Cowan explores our enduring love for the pickup truck. I've seen more bar fights over what truck you drive than I've seen anything else. <laughs> I mean, it's competitive, right? There's no country song about a Camry. That's Tim Esterdahl, publisher of Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk, who says buyers seem especially keen on the idea of keeping up with the Joneses pickup. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Actor and producer Margot Robbie has come a long way from her days on an Australian soap. And as she told me, it's all thanks to hard work, hustle, and a lot of luck. And with the rest of the tourists, here we go through the Paramount Gate. In the movie biz, the Paramount lot in Los Angeles has always been sacred ground, a crossroads for stars of all sizes. And it still is. What's it like walking around here now? I love it. I just have so, I, I remember when shooting up there. I remember I did all my dance lessons around there. I, it was so surreal being on the Paramount lot. Two-time Oscar nominee Margot Robbie says it's a place she never gets tired of. It's so exciting. There is nowhere more magical, nowhere more fun than a movie set. And she should know. What do you say we come in for my close-up now? Her film, Babylon, from our parent company, Paramount, is a picture made the way they used to make them, and maybe never will again. Director Damien Chazelle takes us on a three hour plus deep dive into the chaotic underbelly of 1920s Hollywood, an epic story told in beautiful and sometimes lurid detail, with Robbie's character running off the rails in a place where the parties never seem to end. It seems like you're all about taking risks. Yeah. <laughs> I like taking risks. I love, what can I say? I'm a thrill seeker. It's, it doesn't scare the shit out of me. I normally don't really go for it. The girl seems nice. She is. She has no idea what's next. And in Babylon, there was a lot to be scared of. Many big tears. Big, you got it? Is that gum? Her character, the young actress Nellie Leroy, is a hungry outsider who turns out to be talented beyond anyone's expectations, with powers like the ability to cry her heart out on command. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> Hiya, I'm Nellie Leroy. Do we go on again? Okay, so let's talk about this crying IQ thing. You can really do that. Yes. I did 300 and something episodes on a soap, so I had a fair share of practice <laughs> crying on cue. How? I don't know, mate. I think it's like a muscle. I could say to a director, do you want it on my left eye or right eye? Stop. And tell me the word you want it to drop. And what, what is going <laughs> through your head? Question. Like, where does it come from? I don't know, just... Honestly, it sounds so stupid and, and derivative, but I just think of something sad. <laughs> But in her life, she says, there's really not much to be sad about. Margot Robbie was raised by a single mom in Queensland, Australia. Through sheer persistence, she hit pay dirt at age 17 with a role on the popular Aussie soap, Neighbours. Cue the tears. No, he, prom he promised me he would be home for a special night. 
she was a perfect fit for the show, almost. I had a very strong Australian accent. It was two Australian Way strong for two Australian. neighbors. Two Australian for neighbors. They had a dialect coach come in to make me sound less Australian <laughs> for the most Australian TV show what ever. Is, can you do it? What's a two Australian accent? I, it was very like, oh, how's it going? Like, just, just not nice on the ear. And they tried to round it out. They're like, you're so nasal. We need to just round that out. So ask yourselves, why would Pan Am, the best airline in the world, promote someone so young? But her American accent was good enough to land her a series here, Pan Am, in 2011. It only lasted one season, so she started sending out audition tapes, including a Hail Mary pass to a casting agent for a new Martin Scorsese film, The Wolf of Wall Street. No part of me considered that I would ever, my tape would ever be seen by Martin Scorsese. And she was as surprised as anyone when she got a bite. But when they first told you, oh yeah, Marty wants to see you, your reaction was? I was so confused. I didn't know who Marty was, to be honest. <laughs> I was like, they said Marty, they're like, Marty wants to see you. And I was like, who is Marty? They're like, Martin Scorsese. And I was like, how does he know who I am? They're like, he watched your tape. And I was like, Martin Scorsese watched my audition date? And they're like, yeah, and he wants you to come in and read with Leo. And I was like, Leo as in Leonardo DiCaprio. <gasps> Oh my God, I'm on nickname basis already with everyone. Um, yeah, it was wild. We're gonna be friends? Yeah, you wanna be my friend? We're not gonna be friends. Her performance opened a lot of eyes and a lot of doors. Since then, she's played everything from the Queen of England. Young, clever. Confidence. To a real doll in film Barbie. <laughs> to a complete psychopath. Seriously, what the hell's wrong with you people? We're bad guys, it's what we do. And she went from breaking glass windows to glass ceilings. In 2014, she started her own production company to make female-focused films like this one. For the movie I, Tanya, Robbie actually learned to skate like an Olympic figure skater and to fight like, well, Tanya Harding. I outskated him today. We also judge on presentation. Her turn as Tanya got her the first of two Oscar nods, but also put her on the map as a producer, drawing comparisons to Katherine Hepburn, who used her own business sense to help bring the Philadelphia story to the screen. I'm such an unholy mess of a girl. What do you think of that comparison? Uh, I mean, there could be no high praise for me because I adore <laughs> Catherine Hepburn. Um, but yes, I think I, I definitely have that kind. I've always been like a bit of a, like, yeah, I've had a business savvy brain. When I mean, like, I and Robbie's success has allowed her to do things even more like, important to her than movies. When you got your first paycheck, you had kept a written record of all the money that you'd borrowed from your mom? God, you do your research, yeah. Yeah, I, I have that piece of paper still. I kept it. Um, yeah, everything I owed my mom, I, I had it written down. She'd take money out of like the, the house mortgage, lend me money. So I always knew, I was like, oh, I gotta pay that back. And then one day when I made enough money, I just paid that whole mortgage off completely. I was like, mom, don't even worry about that mortgage anymore. It doesn't even exist anymore. You so, paid off her house. Yeah. That's I, awesome. I think any, honestly, anyone in my position, you'd, you'd do that for your mom, of course you would. Margo. Of course, she's made her mom proud in other ways. The British Film Academy celebrated her lifetime in film. Does it feel kind of weird to get that at such a fairly young age? Yeah, I, I, at first I was like, I don't think I should be getting this. Like, aren't I too young to be getting anything that has the word lifetime in it? Um, but then I was like, but I'll take it, thanks. No, no, honey. Don't worry about that. The car is not mine. And with her latest role, it's clear that she's earned her own place in Hollywood history. I mean, it's, it's iconic. All these studio lots are, especially this one. I know I'm hardworking and blah, 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 but I'm also the luckiest, 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 yeah, person in the world. You know, every time that I did something, I was like, oh, now it's the top. It will never get better than this. And then somehow it's just kept getting better and better. I'm so, so grateful and lucky. 
More exclusive excerpts from our conversation coming up a little later in the show. Up next, America's passion for the pickup truck. The pickup truck is just as American as baseball or apple pie. Lee Cowan traces the pickup's rise from humble farm vehicle to high fashion accessory. More and more and more cars. We Americans have long had a crush on our cars. Some trucks are good for only one thing, rough work. But when it comes to a really committed vehicular relationship, well, it's the pickup truck that sets our hearts aflutter. Turns out things like towing capacity, payload, can really get the motor running. Bring all the gifts for under the tree. And while you're at it, bring the tree. Trucks represented about 20% of U.S. sales this year. That's a tad more than cars. In fact, pickups account for the top three of the five best-selling vehicles. Take Ford's F-Series. It's been America's best-selling truck for over four decades. Just how important are they to Ford's bottom line? We asked CEO Jim Farley. F-Series is the second most valuable consumer product by revenue behind the iPhone. It is enormous. This is the modern horse. It's your reliable partner you can do work on, you can have fun with, you can kind of go anywhere. It just fits an American lifestyle. Pickups are the most popular in the states you'd probably expect. Texas, Wyoming, North Dakota, and the like, where construction, ranching, and hauling are a way of life. But there are plenty of coastal pickups now, too. And look at this, though. We'll steer clear of pickup politics here, but suffice it to say that you can't get sales numbers that big by selling pickups in red states alone. It's millennials, according to J.D. Power, who buy the most new trucks these days. And yes, some have no desire to haul anything more than a bag of groceries. Oh, actually, that was supposed to be for me. I love it. I don't need them for anything. I could drive anything. I just get it. I just drive a game from point A to point B. The number of women interested in pickups has been growing almost every year, too. Do you need a truck, or you just like the way they look? Um, I like the blue one. <laughs> <laughs> the mid-sized truck market is heated up too, like Chevy's Colorado, Ford's Ranger, GMC's Canyon. They may look smaller, but they can be just as capable. Introducing the all-electric Chevy Silverado. And of course, all-electric pickups are no longer a fantasy anymore. While they're far from a farmer's friend just yet, it is another sign that pickups aren't going anywhere. But when it comes down to the question of why, just why do we love something with four wheels and a bed so much? Well, it turns out that's a lot like asking people, why do you like hot dogs at baseball games? Pickups are Americana. And just like hot dogs, you better not get between a hungry fan and their mustard. I've seen more bar fights over what truck you drive than I've seen anything else. <laughs> I mean, it's competitive, right? There's no country song about a Camry. That's Tim Esterdahl, publisher of Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk, who says buyers seem especially keen on the idea of keeping up with the Joneses pickup. We want to bragging rights, right? So, you know, when Ram came out with their new truck, uh, Heavy Duty has 1,000 foot-pounds of torque. The sign was 15 feet high with numbers. <laughs> 1,000 pound feet of torque, you know. And I mean, we wanna, I wanna, you want to buy that truck and say, yeah, I got 1,000 foot pounds of torque. You know, I'm never going to use it. I have no idea how to use it, but I got it. That's the Ram 1500 TRX. You likely won't be boulder crawling on the way to drop your kids off at school. Nor will you be flying over traffic like this but you've got to dig deep to own one. They start around 80 grand. Holla, holla. GMC's all-electric super truck, the Hummer EV, costs over 100 grand. You might not need all of its off-road capability, but to people like Rika Williams, that's not the point. 
it's not about what you need. It's what about it's about what you like, what you enjoy, what you deserve. Yeah. Okay? And you know what, honey? I deserve this. <laughs> the biggest capacity many trucks boast of these days is the amount of luxury in tow. As a press conference once for Ram, they're launching a new truck, and they, I went to the CEO and he's done. I said, I didn't know you're talking about a full-size truck or a Chanel handbag. Quilted leather, heated steering wheels, panoramic sunroofs are all riches of the modern truck that have some old school Texas ranchers like Pat Mackey scratching their farmer's tan. I mean, I've never seen anybody stand up in the sunroof and rope a cow on the top of one. So I don't think you need a sunroof and all that stuff in there. While big may be better on a ranch, maybe not in traffic. Some of the biggest trucks these days have grills so blunt and so high. Critics worry they create a blind zone, dwarfing bicyclists, pedestrians, and especially children. They look like they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year, are they? Well, over time, they have gotten bigger. Yeah. The cabs grew, two rows of seats, better for families and transporting people. That's Ford executive Ted Canis, who points out that many of today's trucks, including Ford, have technologies like pre-collision assist with pedestrian detection and automatic emergency braking. All pretty high-tech stuff for a truck. Dodge gives you toughness, traction, and a ton of know-how in four-wheel drive. The trucks we used to know were as homely as a hound dog. Dents were character. Rust offered a two-tone look. And the dash, well, that was just a place for smokes, as our longtime Sunday morning humorist Roger Welsh once observed. Most of the stuff in real pickup trucks should be unusable or unidentifiable. Real pickup trucks have things growing in the bed or in the cab. Our three-quarter ton Chevy Cheyenne is actually pulling 187 tons on this level road. That legacy is still present. Trucks remain the symbol of Dust Bowl determination. But these days, you can dress them up or dress them down, drive up walls, or drive down Wall Street. This is great. <laughs> Not bad for something Henry Ford once envisioned as simply a way to haul some hay. Way to go. Do you think about what you'll leave behind? We'll have more with Margot Robbie coming up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more from my conversation with Margot Robbie. So when you watched Wolf of Wall Street, you didn't think that your acting was all that, I mean, you said you didn't feel like until I, Tanya, that you'd really, that that yeah. was that you nailed it acting wise? No, I didn't think I nailed it actually in Wolf. I thought I could have done better. I was bummed I held back in some instances actually. I know that doesn't seem like a that character. That was holding that, back? Yeah, I, that was holding back a little bit. And I think it was because I was, you know, I, I don't know, I just wasn't as confident back then. And I, I don't know, I, I think I, I had great moments in Wolf of Wall Street, but I, I, I felt like I was still, I could have done better. <laughs> wow. It's a beautiful performance, but okay. Yes. <laughs> but so then, so then you do I, Tanya, and that gave you the courage to write a letter. Yes, to, to uh, one of my absolute heroes, Quentin Tarantino. I adore Tarantino films and always, always, always dreamed of being in a Tarantino film. That is like always been a bucket list. So you like not email, you penned a letter. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very analog person. I write everything down. I do everything handwritten. Um, but I also know that he writes, you know, he's a very analog person, like only has a home phone, you know, I, you know, obviously read everything that there is to read about him. So I thought he'd appreciate a letter more than an email. Plus I was like, I don't even know if he has email. I don't know if he does that. <laughs> and it worked. And it worked. Thank God he got that letter right after finishing writing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So much of what has happened to you seems lucky. But the truth is, it really is a combination of your preparing and going for it and then luck coming in the door. Yeah, there definitely is an element of luck, but it's like, I don't know, it's like you have to work really, really, really hard so that there's room for luck to come in. It's like you got to work and work and work and work and do so much hard work and so much preparation and just tee up all the potential opportunities. So 
One of the themes of the movie is this idea that you're only in Hollywood maybe for a short time, but that what you create lasts forever. Yes. So I'm sure it's made you think a little bit about your own legacy, right? Even though you're so young. No, definitely. Do you think about what you'll leave behind? Definitely. It's why I, it's, it's why I had such a strong reaction to this movie. Like I said, I felt like this will be a movie people will watch in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I'll be a part of that history. I'll be part of the legacy and that lives forever. And there's a gorgeous scene in this movie between Jean Smart and Brad Pitt. And she says exactly that. She's like, yeah, you're gonna die, but like you will forever, someone will, you know, put on a film and you'll be dining with angels and ghosts for eternity. And it's so beautiful knowing you're, yeah, gonna be on celluloid forever doing that movie is, is so special, yeah. But yes, definitely at the start of my career, my, my uh, focus was just like getting a job, getting, getting a foot in the door. I, I would do any job just to be on a film set. And then once I was established, it was like, okay, what do, you know, now that I know I can keep getting jobs, what other jobs I wanna do. And for me, I want, I want to be in films that are gonna stand the test of time. You know, I watch movies from the past. Like I said, Philadelphia Story, one of my, favorite films like I rarely watch a current day movie very rarely do I watch something that's just come out um I'm always watching something from the 30s or the 70s whenever but uh you know I want to be in movies that that have that lasting effect a little PCU lives forever a little PCU lives forever exactly I'm Tracy Smith thanks for joining us we'll see you here next time on here comes the sun